is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and we've gathered an amazing panel to discuss security for an agile government. I want to invite our viewers to use the Q&A icon to ask questions of our panelists. You can do this in the top right corner of your viewing window by clicking the icon with the little boxes and then clicking on Q&A. And we're going to start with some brief introductions. I'll start. I'm Elizabeth Raley, Director of Professional Services at Civic Actions. I'm a practicing Scrum Master and also on the steering committee of AGL. And next, let's go to John. Hi, uh, my name is John Tidwell. I'm the Information Security Officer for Collin County in Texas. That's uh, one county north of Dallas. And we have the extinguished or distinguished challenge of doing security for a local county government and finding ways to where, to, where do we start and how do we measure our success. And we are developing a, uh, an agile platform, moving to a, a scrum methodology to uh, just kind of build, a, build the car as we drive it so to speak, and uh, we're here to share some of our lessons learned and uh, some of the tips and tricks of what is and is not working for us right now uh, for the betterment of uh, government as a whole. Thanks, John. Let's go to Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Gallimore. I'm a partner and co-founder at Excella Consulting. We're about a 140-person consulting shop based in Arlington, Virginia. Um, my particular role at Excella is I run our services unit, and over the last couple of years, uh, a big focus of mine and ours has been DevOps thing, uh, in both DevOps in the government, DevOps in the private sector, everybody doing the DevOps. So, yeah, it's something I'm really passionate about, love talking about it, so it's good to be here. Thanks, Jeff. Gabriel, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so I'm a developer for 18F. Uh, right now I'm working on the cloud.gov project, and along with that, uh, a new tool called Masonry to help uh, essentially uh, government organizations get their ATO materials together. Thanks. Rob, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rob Reed. I was a Presidential Innovation Fellow in 2013. I was a co-founder of 18F uh, within the GSA, and in particular, I started the branch of 18F called 18F Consulting. Uh, I currently am not in federal service. I've created a um, charity called Public Invention, and I build robots like that one. Thanks, Rob. And Greg, let's go to you. My name is Greg Ellen. I'm the founder and president of GovReady. Uh, and before that, I was actually the chief data officer at the Federal Communications Commission. Um, when we were there, cybersecurity and uh, com FISMA compliance was really the primary constraint on how fast we could deliver new services to citizens and how fast we could onboard exciting new technologies. Uh, so it was something that I really wanted to make better. And at GovReady, we're trying to make um, FISMA into something that developers love to do. Uh, and we're working on something right now that you could think of as a kind of TurboTax for FISMA, an open source expert system that connects um, FISMA uh, everyday activities with higher level cybersecurity goals. So I think that um, we recently uh, I'm uh, lucky enough to do some work with Elizabeth at Civic Actions and recently had a chance to put together some slides that talked about driving compliance into the Agile process, something that we've been working on. So uh, I wanted to, I'm going to try to share those slides as kind of a um, kickoff point um, for our discussion. So in the first slide, this should look pretty familiar to everyone in this audience. It's your very, it's the, it's the sprint process where over on the upper left, you begin by getting input from customers and team members, and you've got a product owner who's responsible. That input all ends up in a product backlog in the form of different stories. You get to an individual sprint kickoff meeting where you pick what work you want to do, um, and you do your planning. And as you move along, you've got your plan, and then you begin the sprint process. Uh, it might be anywhere from one to four weeks, and every day people are doing activities. At the end of the sprint, you do the demonstration, you get the approval on the code you've done so far, and now you've got running code. So the basic agile process. Now, the idea of injecting um, security goals really starts early in the agile process where basically, in addition to people that are talking about features, if you're developing for government or you're concerned about cybersecurity, you want to include, you can see the green circles, 
you want to actually include cybersecurity requirements in the production of your backlog. And here what we've indicated it is the NIST risk management framework and the ISO, the information security officer, information security manager, being stakeholders in the process and being able to drive the security as stories that end up on the product backlog along with everything else. Um, so if you're thinking about multi-factor authentication or audits, that that just becomes another story. And I think that that's the key secret. So once you've done that, as you're in your daily activities, in addition to task delivery and standard QA with unit testing, we've now injected information assurance. So, it, inf so our cybersecurity tests, our scanning of our systems, becomes something that we do alongside of every other type of unit testing. And then finally, when we get our review, we now have the demonstration approval and the audit information for that iteration of the system. And then we can ship the product, and that way, to sum it up, we're really doing cybersecurity and we're producing the necessary um, artifacts for compliance as we're building the system rather than something that happens at the end. And I'll hand it back. Thank you, Greg. Um, so uh, let me thank our awesome panelists here and let me point out that uh, it's very important to have viewer participation on this show. So if anyone has any question, it will, will really help us if you will chat it in through the Q&A tool. We'll be able to see it and direct it to our panelists here. Um, some of you may be beginners in this. Some of you may be experts who have a lot of opinions to offer. We're happy to have both of you. Um, it's also the case that many people watch this show on YouTube uh, after it has been produced. Uh, and we would be uh, happy if you guys would promote that by liking the show on YouTube and perhaps subscribing to the Agile Gov Leadership channel on YouTube. Um, so let me just give a little bit of an introduction uh, to what I view the problems here are, and then perhaps we can return to Greg's diagram and get down into some nitty-gritty details. Um, I do not consider myself a security expert. I do consider myself an Agile expert. and one of the problems uh, that is some, has been sometimes encountered and it is now being fought by people like 18F, Noah Kunin, and Gabriel uh, who's on the show here is that agile development is at odds with security. In fact, it is not at odds with security. It is perhaps at odds with the mindset that some government agencies have had of having to have a very rigorous security policy uh, and then a gate where you say, I'm going to sign an authority to operate, and then I'm going to avoid changing anything for as long as possible. And that attitude, which stems from the risk-averse nature of government people trying to keep things safe, actually um, makes things less safe because software is changing all of the time, and you have to respond to that. You have to respond to threats and weaknesses and updates in your system. And in my experience, one source of a lack of security was the fact that many, much of the software was so out of date that it was not uh, up to date and secure. So what we want to talk about to some extent on this show is both government security and how it relates to the agile iterative process, which is really necessary in a modern world for security. Um, so let me begin with a question here, uh, and I, I'll direct it first to Greg, but someone else might want to chime in, um, particularly John, since he's uh, from the county uh, government, and we really appreciate him being here. Um, Tim Nolan writes, what security tools do you recommend to use for security testing during a sprint? And I think Greg already mentioned scanning, but perhaps uh, you could elaborate on that, Greg. Sure. Um, so, so uh, Tim, let me, let me first just set this up a little bit um, to answer the question, and I'll describe three tools. Um, we live in a world right now where many of the security tools are, kind, are designed for and owned by the, the security uh, organization within the enterprise or within the agency. And so as a consequence, you're absolutely right, a lot of developers don't know what tools to use. So the, a really key tool that security likes to use is something called a, nest, it's called a scanner 
which checks for the con proper configuration of the operating system and potentially other software, um, and also checks for vulnerabilities. Um, one in many, what I've seen in many government agencies is the Nessus scanner is very popular from Tenable, but developers aren't allowed to use it. So a good alternative to that is something called OpenSCAP, O-P-E-N-S-C-A-P, which is an open source certified, a NIST certified scanner um, that's available, uh, and you can find it on GitHub or just Google it. Um, my own company, GovReady, we make a little tool belt that makes it easy for developers to install OpenSCAP and use it um, and makes it a little bit easier to use on the command line. The other two tools that you might want to begin to look at, OWASP makes a few tools that help people look at um, the how secure their web stacks are. Uh, and another tool that developers are starting to look a lot at is called Gauntlet. Um, and that's spelled like Gauntlet, only without an E at the end. G-A-U-N-L-T, I think it is. Um, with uh, It's missing an E. Uh, but those are three different tools that are all open source that you could begin to use within your stack. And like anything else with Agile, I'd recommend uh, starting with just one and starting with just a little piece to figure out how to use it. Thank you, Greg. And I'd like to point out that um, Mark Schwartz, who's been on the show uh, and was on a very popular uh, episode, also um, insists on having scanning on a weekly basis. Uh, so I believe that's kind of um, uh, a best practice that everybody agrees with. Um, so perhaps now we can turn it over to Gabriel and talk about some of the things he's been doing which are similar to what GovReady has done with uh, 18F's um, uh, FISMA Ready program and the uh, masonry project. Um, that unfortunately will be focused on the federal government, but uh, maybe we could hear about what you're doing, Gabriel. Sure. So. Basically, right now, what we're working on is, is this project called Control Masonry. And it's developing very quickly, but also there are a lot of different iterations. Uh, so let me start with kind of the goal of this whole project. So the, the, the pain point that we discovered um, was that essentially, like, developers don't understand compliance. Um, and a lot of times when we were figuring out the whole SSP process, the whole process of understanding this, we kept on getting surprised and we kept on running into all these issues because we didn't we didn't fundamentally understand how the entire process worked. So our main goal was to essentially put together a tool that essentially spoke the developer language. So we're organizing everything by by components, components that developers understand, and getting them to essentially take these components and like explain how they work and convert that into compliance documents. So um, right now, um, the first thing we wanted to test out, is it possible to store all this, inf all this information in, in a machine readable format? So like we proved that. Secondly, we decided, well, is it possible to generate documentation from that? So we went about proving that. And this is where we're at right now. Next, we'll probably build a, a command line tool to make it easier for people to, to work on their individual projects. But um, as we move on, we'd love to always have people participate, uh, give us suggestions, and kind of define on uh, how this project is going. Because I think I think a lot of times a lot of time is waste is, is wasted figuring out how 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 the how NIST works, how the compliance process works, when a lot more time could be spent actually making your systems more secure. That's an excellent point. Thank you. And um, by the way, those projects you mentioned are available on GitHub. Uh, those of you who are interested in, in seeing what they are or participating can find them pretty easily on GitHub uh, under the name uh, uh, FISMA Ready and um, Gabriel, what was the name of the masonry thing? Uh, it's Control-Masonry. So Control-Masonry. Yeah, it's uh, a, a repo. Thank you. So it's very easy, if you, at least if you're a developer, to go and check those things out. And um, now I would like to open up to anybody on the panel and also to our audience. Um, Gabriel made a very, very important point uh, that compliance is not security. And when I was uh, in the government trying to get an ATO on the Prices Paid project, a security officer very kindly pointed out to me that no one ever broke into a site because the paperwork wasn't done they break into a site because it's not secure, right? And our fundamental goal 
for the American people is to be secure and compliance exists to service that goal, not to get in the way of that goal. But I know sometimes when you're dealing with the federal government, it feels like it just gets in the way of the goal rather than um, uh, actually serving that goal. Perhaps the comment, the the panel could comment on the interplay between compliance and actual security. So, so I'll go ahead and take that on, and it's as if you were eavesdropping. <clears throat> Thanks, as if you were. No, no problem. It's as if you were eavesdropping on a conversation I had earlier today uh, about build standards and compliance and how that is a means to an end. Uh, and it's just as you said, we ha we were following the CIS benchmarks ourselves as a means to hit the top 20 critical controls. So uh, the version six was just released in the last uh, I think two weeks or so, uh, and we're looking at, at ways of how do we implement these standards and how do we measure compliance against those. And it's a means of getting in front of our security by means of implementing uh, compliance, per se, getting our standards in place and finding a tool to measure those. And does compliance mean security? No. Does security mean compliance? No. But uh, we're finding the way to be the, the yin and the yang for those. And we're, we're starting from the compliance standpoint, for technical controls across our environment as a means to make our environment more secure for all of the data, both for what we serve to the public but I would say also for the uh, important internal data to ourselves, our employees, that we want to be shielded from the outside as well. And we're, we're looking at control to uh, measuring against those controls to get that done. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I'd like to jump in. Uh, I think, Rob, um, one of the, that it's in order to do compliance, um, in order to kind of get comfortable with it, I think you really do have to embrace the idea that compliance is not security. It is not what it's there for. But what compliance is, is a, pro is a method of scaling security to the organization. And that's where we really need developers and um, agile projects to embrace that notion. Because what, what we have right now, um, if, you think about com if you think about buildings, um, we have elaborate compliance processes in place that have to do with the supply chain so that the materials are good, that there's a construction process where there are inspections along the ways when a building is built so that we have confidence our buildings don't fall down. Because none of us individually could inspect a house we're buying or a building we're going into and know whether that building was trustworthy. So we have to rely on a process. And that process is compliance, right? And, and so we need developers to get on board because security people are guarding against real problems that are happening. They're walking the perimeter and they're protecting important assets. Compliance is about taking a practice that works and making it easy for the entire organization to embrace and do at scale across multiple projects. And that's what developers are really good at, right? It's about, so it's not about doing the paperwork. It's about making it easy to scale cybersecurity. And as Gabriel was pointing out, and I, a compliance that we're going to love as developers is one where the paperwork is produced automatically out of the work we're doing, just like our information radiators, just like our, our um, burn down charts are all produced out of, automatically out of the work that we do, not as something extra to the work. Thank you very much. Um, so, Jeff, uh, I wonder if you can comment on how your developers uh, approach that um, uh, issue of, of utilizing a process to make themselves more effective. Uh, well, when you're looking at um, the, the, the process that well, so to to, uh, to the point that you made earlier that you're a, you're a big fan of the agile way of, of doing things, so are we. Um, and then taking that even to the next level with DevOps, which isn't a process as much as it is a mindset um, and an emphasis on collaboration. So to make um, to make everybody more effective, including the developers. It's aligning everybody towards whatever the objective is. So the process has to be in service of the objective. And if that process encourages collaboration uh, among people with different skill sets and perspectives and backgrounds, um, 
like dev and ops and security and business and customers, then everybody wins in that because you're valuing everybody's perspective. You're bringing those in hopefully early and often. Um, and instead of trying to hold people at arm's length, like it's just be honest, like it has happened with dev and ops and security and even the business for a long, long time, um, bad things happen when, 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 uh, when you have that sort of a mindset. So when you do appreciate those other perspectives and when you do try to understand where they're coming from and you do value the skill set and the expertise and the perspective that they're bringing, then everybody can move much more effectively, much more quickly, um, and you can do things better, faster, cheaper uh, than you have in the past and, and be able to accomplish those objectives. So in the case of security and, and, and compliance, uh, bringing those, uh, those InfoSec experts in at the beginning and understanding uh, what are the objectives that we're trying to accomplish in terms of protecting the assets um, and protecting the reputation of the organization and making sure that that is a value uh, that we all share as a team and as an organization. Uh, and that the process supports that so that you're looking at it from what are the interaction points uh, that we have um, of people with different skill sets along the way, um, what are the, uh, what's the automation and the technology and the tool chain that we're using to support those mindsets and reinforce those behaviors. Um, and making sure that we're all clear on, uh, on what those interactions and expectations really are. Uh, so that's a long-winded way of saying uh, the process that we use is, 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 there is a process to it, but it really starts with the mindset that we're all bringing, uh, that we all have a valuable part to play in achieving the, the objectives and helping the organization win. Thank you, Jeff. And your uh, mention of DevOps is, I think, very important. Um, I can tell an embarrassing story about myself uh, related to that. But before I get to that, I'd like to re-invite our audience to submit any questions. Um, one thing about DevOps uh, that I think is pretty important for people to understand is some programmers focus on computer programming and are not very knowledgeable about system administration and they're not very knowledgeable about what we might call DevOps, uh, and yet security weaknesses can occur in several different ways. One is a computer programmer makes a mistake, which is a security flaw and allows someone to attack something. Another one is simply that someone leaves the door open, and that's more of a DevOps type issue. And um, I think we can see examples of both in the heinous security problems that um, come to light publicly, um, some of which have to do with um, uh, government software simply not being updated uh, quickly enough. Um, I wonder if the panel could comment on what the policies should be to make sure that the large stack of software, which al you almost always depend upon uh, to keep your system secure, which is analogous to what Greg was talking about in terms of the material within our building. Uh, you know, you have to trust that the girders are, are proper. Um, uh, how you make sure that that entire infrastructure is up to date on an ongoing basis. Well, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big question, Rob. Uh, how do you make sure that this complex stack of, of technology that we use that's required to deliver the systems, the modern systems um, that support the mission and the business objectives, stays up to date? Um, there's a, a, a friend of mine, his name's Josh Corman, he's uh, the CTO at Sonatype, and he's, he, he uh, has made it his mission in life to help people understand um, the software delivery process in the context and using the metaphor of a software supply chain, uh, which I think is, is um, a really powerful metaphor in, in terms of how do, you, uh, how do you deal with the complexity of today's systems um, and still achieve the objectives that you want to achieve that are meaningful and valuable, one of which being security. Uh, 
And so he um, he's done a lot of things, and I would encourage anybody who has the opportunity to, to hear Josh speak or to watch one of his presentations to do that because he will say it a lot more eloquently than I can. Um, but the idea is that, number one, you need to know what is included in your systems, what software you're using to actually build your systems because you don't if you don't know what's in there, how can you manage it? So visibility is really, really important. Um, and he uses the, um, the, the context of a, of, a, of a manifest, a software manifest. So when you build a system, what is the software inventory? What are the third party or open source packages that you're using? And making sure that that, that, that is exposed so you know what you're dealing with. And that goes all the way down to the version numbers or the build numbers. Because different versions of software obviously have different, uh, different characteristics and attributes. So that's one thing. And then the other really important thing that, that he emphasizes is, is in addition to knowing what you have in the system, it's being able to respond to changes quickly. And there, that is a, that's an iceberg um, with a lot of it being under the waterline in terms of how that happens. But um, just to pull the, uh, uh, you know, the heart bleed example from a little while ago, a lot of organizations knew that they had um, they had that vulnerable OpenSSL package uh, it running in their infrastructure, but it took them forever to be able to, to patch that and to, to, to address that vulnerability because they did not have the ability to respond quickly to any detected vulnerability. So that, as a, as a capability, needs to be baked into how you do things. So visibility and ability to respond to change I think are the two really important things to do that to keep Okay, so let's let's get into that a little bit. Um, so exactly what makes a system able to respond to change quickly? I mean, if you have a system and you already have an inventory and you've got 35 different software components and you discover by watching the nightly news that there's a major hack in one of the software systems uh, within your uh, system, what should you do and what should you have done in preparation to be able to address that problem quickly. So I, I go ahead. To, go ahead, John on? first, and then Greg. So I, I was just going to uh, compound on the knowing what you have uh, point that that was made, and having an asset inventory is is key. Obviously, have, knowing you, you can't know what to defend unless you know what it is that you're defending. So in my experience, and even at the at the county here. Having an improper software uh, asset inventory is going to be a major hurdle for any organization that is trying to respond. Because if you don't know what you have, you don't know how to protect it. On top of that, I think one other key point is tying ownership to those apps and to those systems, both from a technical and a business standpoint, so that when you know X, Y, and Z server out in your DMZ is found vulnerable to, to hard bleed, the technical owner who's going to administrate that change needs to have a contact to go and understand how quickly. Oftentimes, um, a business owner may say, well, we can't take it offline, but maybe not understanding why it is that a machine can or cannot be taken offline. And I think that echoes to a relationship that security practitioners need to have at the business level uh, and at the administrative level, not only to um, system owners, but then I think also to the next question it might bleed into, into development teams. Um, I think it was spoken earlier, uh, you know, development teams have a development background and security engineers have a security background and those aren't necessarily the same. And uh, I, th I believe a role as a security officer, because that's what, that's what I do, is to be an evangelist for security and be out to show that security is an enabler. You know, we don't need to be saying no all the time. We need to understand business processes and how to wrap security around those. And part of that is learning how to speak different languages, both from a business owner standpoint and then from a development standpoint, uh, you know, speaking to a coder and, and understanding how we can come to common, common language to bring about security for the, for the good of the whole. Thank you. We have a question from the audience which will relate to that, but I want to give Greg a chance to respond before we move on to that. Yeah, I, I thought that Jeff did a really great job of describing the metaphor, um, you know, describing the, the potential power of thinking of software as something that's assembled with the software supply chain. And what I wanted to do is, is answer a little bit of, well, how do we really do that, especially for some of our listeners who may not be developers themselves or um, may not be as familiar with DevOps. 
And uh, so the I want to introduce a a metric here that all that I think that everyone and everyone listening can kind of do a rough estimate on a system that they're working on. That metric is mean time to full stack replacement. In other words, how long would it take you to completely replace, to build from scratch, all of the software that and the computing environment that represents your stack? So if you wanted to upgrade every single component or you simply needed to reinstall every component cleanly, how long would it take you, the mean time, the average time, to full stack replacement? Now, the reality is your mean time to full stack replacement is going to be days or weeks unless you are using some type of automated tooling known in the DevOps world as continuous integration and delivery. Unless you have actually turned in your installation process into software. In other words, we, what's really exciting right now and kind of what led me to the path that I'm on and made me feel like FISMA paperwork was something we could solve was the emergence of software-defined computing environments where everything in the data center is defined by software. Right, so it's not, a, it's not an individual sitting around typing in the install instructions, but it's actually another piece of software um, running a script or running a sequence of scripts that in, completely installs the stack. So a couple of ones that are popular, Ansible, Puppet, and Chef. And what's really exciting is this, is this year, Chef has introduced an audit mode into their tooling thinking about another tool which will allow you to run scans as part of your continuous integration and delivery pipeline so that they st so chef is one of the major players is now starting to bake in this capability so this is really exciting and I kind of wanted to and if you if you don't quite understand what I'm saying if you're a developer and you've ever used a lock file for your Ruby on Rails gems or for something else you can think of the lock file as a kind of application specific version of what Chef or Puppet is doing where they're actually defining the entire compute environment, how the software gets installed, how it connects, et cetera, et cetera. And I, and I also kind of want to um, serve this over to um, Gabriel because I think that this is what's exciting about um, cloud.gov, that there's actually a model that 18F is offering of this entire workflow. Am I correct on that, Gabriel? Yeah. Um, basically, we're using Cloud Foundry uh, to build out like secure instances of, so people can put their software on them. And um, as a process, I think what it's really going to be powerful for is not only having a secure system, but at the same time, uh, essentially having a system that is partially halfway ATO'd. So essentially, 80% of your compliance is completed already, and we'll handle a lot of the monitoring. And all you have to worry about is that last 20% that your application goes on, on top of. So we're hoping that, at least with cloud.gov, it will be one solution for people to build secure systems and build, them, and build their software quickly and deploy it quickly. Well, I think that's just brilliant. Um, thank you, Greg. That was a very... Um, a uh, cogent way of describing the problem and some of the things that's going on. Thank you, Gabriel, for being part of that. Um, I'd like to push back on that a little bit and um, think about uh, what it means to replace the software stack. So uh, I have used Puppet and a few of those other tools um, to produce a one-button deployment of a system. Right, so that the system, the deployment of the system is completely automatic. So it it is not particularly prone to human error. Okay, but that does not necessarily mean that, for example, if some uh, exploit is found in Postgres, that I can instantly switch to MySQL or some other database within within my system. So, um, what does it mean? You know, it, it's nice to say, well, I have a mean time to full stack replacement, but what does that mean if you can't replace the individual components uh, that quickly? 
So, Greg, perhaps you can comment on that. And it may be that I'm just not describing. No, I, I think that that's a, I think that that's a really I think that that's a fair uh, that's a really fair question. Um, the and and this is actually why um, when we think about compliance as something that helps us scale security, or we think about you know John as a security expert. We we you know um, another the question that came is should a security staffer be part of the scrum the scrum team or should dev know more about security matters and I think the answer is kind of both um, but that the the security people should be stakeholders that are a part of the agile process as at, in, to the same extent that any other stakeholder would be and you want them as as part of the process exactly so you can answer the question. That um, that Rob just posed, right? It's like, okay, great. I I I've got my software-defined infrastructure. Um, I can, if the system is compromised, I can completely deploy an entirely new stack, and I and I can get rid of the fact that 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 uh, uh, someone might be on my system. But what if I learn that one of my components is severely compromised, and I want to go to a different component? How do I deal with that risk? And the answer is, you want to address it through a kind of security in depth, and the particular way you do it is in conversation with your security team and figure out, because maybe the solution is when, when our database for this particular component, our most vulnerable component is our database. And the hardest component for us to change is going to be our database. Right, so we've got a risk here, and how can we address that risk? Well, we need to talk to the security people and figure out some strategies, and then we get into pot and possible ideas like, well, maybe we need to corner quarantine certain data that's especially valuable. Maybe we need to look at twelve the ideas of twelve factor apps so that we have some really clean APIs that are protecting stuff. Maybe there's some special tools that the security people have that can get us through a period of vulnerability um, when we're in it. So, it, it, Rob, you're, I think the answer to your question is, yeah, we, you can't just swap out MySQL for Postgres, right? The more you design modular components, which is why people are looking a lot at 12-factor app or they're looking at microservices, you might be able to if you design the system that way, right? If you really think it through and there's a clean API, maybe you can swap that component out. But the process really is so complex as, as Jeff was alluding to that you need all hands on deck talking about these things and using everyone's talent to come up with solutions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So now let me change tack a, li a little bit here and um, explain one thing that happened to me when I was working in the government. I was working on the Price is Paid project and I was trying to get uh, go through the security process and I'd read all the NIST controls and had worked all of them out. Uh, and I, you. <laughs> I was doing an, you know, an adequate job working with the security officers uh, and then we got close to being ready to go live and we did a penetration test and we paid a hacker to attack my system and he got in and it was very embarrassing uh, but it was a very good experience in the sense that um, it improved the software tremendously and after that being the enthusiastic person that I, that I was this was just at the beginning of 18F uh, when I was sh shifting from being a presidential innovation fellow into 18F um, I suggested that we have White Hat Wednesdays at 18F and uh, attack our own software uh, every every week. I'm afraid that never came about, or at least it didn't come about while I was working there. I overlapped, my tenure at H&F overlapped Gabriel's by about three months, I, th I think, or two months um, there. Could the panel, so many of the things we've been talking about up to now have been talking about automated software processes and having an inventory of components and being able to change a component or patch a component if you find that the component is flawed. However, that's not quite the same as actively using human intelligence to look for flaws, which in my limited experience is a very, very powerful way to find security flaws. Um, I wonder if the um, 
panel broadly, including you, Elizabeth, perhaps, um, can comment on um, the role of white hat hacking or um, very active approaches to finding security flaws. So, so I'll jump in as a uh, <clears throat> soon to be certified pen tester myself. I, I like the layered approach towards uh, finding vulnerabilities. Uh, what, there's, there's the automate. What is the layered approach? So I, what, the way I would describe it is having our, our automated vulnerability scanner to scan the wire uh, on an interval, probably weekly in our case, uh, is what we're moving towards, just to find you know signatures of vulnerabilities, uh, feeding that into our process to remediate, and then leveraging an outside entity. Uh, for ourselves as a local entity in the, in the state of Texas, we are afforded a, uh, a very generous external penetration test, uh, web app vulnerability test every year, um, just for free. It, it's something that's great that local governments in Texas can take advantage of. I don't know that enough do. Uh, if anybody from the state of Texas locally wants to know about it, reach out to me. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you know. But that, that kind of Outside uh, mindset is what we need to make sure that we're secure, make sure that we're picking up on vulnerabilities that are missed. And then we also uh, have our own IT assessment that we're performing every year, uh, at which point I can write custom actions inside of there to run another full pen test if we want to. But those are the, the three means that we're looking to use. Uh, maybe not all when we go to the outside entity or as quick as or, or as desired, but, it, but it's a start. And um, I, I, I see great value on having, like you said, that the mindset of a, of a white hat human, uh, or gray hat as it were, even if you get to that case, to, to scan us from the outside in. Let, let us know what we're missing. Um, let me know. I don't need to necessarily know the strengths. What are the weaknesses? And you know, there's, there's certain value that we're going to get from humans that do that day in and day out that we're not going to get from our automated tools. So you know, layering it from, from those two approaches, I think, is, the, uh, is, is, is a solid way to, to, to find your vulnerabilities. And, and as long as you have a means to address them, uh, which is another can of worms that we can talk about, um, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a solid way to find where, where your weaknesses are. So I, I'm going to also jump in. I, I think the reason that the tool chains and the DevOps culture is so important in this process is that if your mean time to full stack replacement is a week or God forbid like an entire month you're going to be resistant about doing real penetration testing because that penetration testing has the risk of bringing down the system and if it brings down the system it's going to take you a week or a month to get it back on track and worse than that in many government agencies our production environments are significantly different than our development environments. And because of that, it's very hard for people to do legitimate pin testing because the environments are so different. And so we really need um, to be able to have software defined. Did you have a question, Rob? Well, yeah, I, I just want, it may not be obvious to everyone watching this, this show exactly how the difference between a development environment and production environment would play out. So perhaps you could expand on that. Sure. Um, I think it's very common at many agencies um, in which the developers are working on Windows machines and they're developing on their Windows machines and they, they've got some hack together where they're basically running, if you're doing a LAMP stack, they're running the database, they're running the web server, they're running um, the application, give it Drupal or WordPress or something, all on kind of one machine and maybe they're using something like MAMP or whatever to run that environment. But in reality, in the production environment, there's a load balancer, there are multiple machines that have the servers, the database is on a different server, there are particular ports that are open which things are talking to, so the, so the actual environment is very different. And the penetration testers, they want to do the test on the environment where this is going to run, right? So um, in, a, in a perfect you're, world, your development environment would be almost identical to your production environment. Right. And these days, it's actually possible to have that perfect world. And I, I want to emphasize that to everybody listening. It is possible to have that, emphasize, that perfect world. We can buy computers with 8, 16 gigabytes of memory on it, and we've got things like Vagrant and Docker now that allow you to set up multiple virtual machines that talk to each other. And if you don't want to do that, 
it's cheap, cheap, I tell you, to go to some of these hosting environments and spin up multiple machines, uh, whether you do that with Cloud Foundry, Amazon, or DigitalOcean, um, and there are wonderful tools that integrate this all together. Right, um, and, so and cheap it, might, mean, might mean 20 bucks a month. So it might be right. really, it's really cheap. And, and some of those are even, and even if you have a really rich environment where you're spinning up powerful machines, you only have to pay by the hour on something like AWS. So you right. could spin up a really complex environment, do your penetration testing, blow the sucker up, and then do it again the next day or the next week. And if you're only you paying have, for one hour out of every day. And you're only paying for an hour or a couple of hours. And it, so a lot of it is really, it's our mindset where we believe that this is possible and we go out there and we get the tools and we put them in place where our culture is, hey, I'm going to spin up a disposable system. I'm going to use, I'm going to try cloud, I'm going to try GovCloud or some of these other components and I'm going to, I'm going to give it a try. Um, and I'm going to invite everybody into that conversation um, versus, Oh, I've got to send an email. I've got to fill out a form to get a server spun up, you know, um, which is decidedly unagile. Right. Right. Well, thank you. Those are all very brilliant points. Um, let me just ask another question. I mean, when I was working for the government, it seemed like there was a reluctance to do penetration testing for some of the reasons mentioned. One was the, the fact that it could disturb the production environment. Um, but I personally was unwilling to do penetration testing on my own systems for fear that someone would arrest me, you know, that, it, that my noble effort would be misinterpreted, uh, you know, which it, it might be, uh, because how is a security officer to know the difference? Um, and so I wonder, uh, Gabriel, John, maybe Jeff, you know, um, do we need a little bit of a cultural or bureaucracy hack in addition to the important software hack that Greg has talked about of making automating the deployment process to support a culture of penetration testing somehow? I'll just throw that out. I don't know if anyone wants it. Maybe maybe no one wants to answer that question. <laughs> well, I'll I, I don't run from the challenge on that one. Um, so, so there's a couple, um, a couple of points, and I'm going to go back to my, not to sound like a one-hit wonder here, but, but back to that DevOps mindset. You were afraid to do the pen testing because somebody might detect that activity and, and have an oh crap moment and, and, and start locking stuff down and you know, other bad things organizationally might happen. Well, with that DevOps mindset, when you start to have the mindset of collaboration, along the way, that security officer was probably intimately involved in the planning for that penetration testing activity and knows exactly what's happening, when it's happening, and why it's happening. So they're on the lookout for it already and, and hopefully valuing that activity. Um, and then the, the, another part of this is um, back to the, the environment conversation is with some of the, the newer deployment strategies, and one of the terms I'll throw out there is a blue-green deployment strategy, is that you can create a whole new production-ready environment that just hasn't been flipped on yet as, as live, which really is just moving the network traffic from one environment to the next. So you can have your next-gen production environment all ready to go, and you can do whatever you want with it because it is not yet accessible to the outside. Um, you can you can do all of your penetration testing. You can do all of your um, all of your smoke testing on it, making sure that that environment is all ready to go before you finally flip that last switch to make it ready for the public. Um, and that will give you that environment congruency that you want all along the way, and have the confidence that that production ready environment is actually in fact ready and secure the way that you need it to be, without having to compromise that it's a not quite ready production environment like Greg was talking about. So back to the, the mindset aspect of this, engaging the security pros and the people who are accountable for that early and often and along the way and bringing them in as first class citizens in, in, in the process. And then second of all, using some of the approaches, the tactics, the tooling uh, to be able to accomplish some of the things that we haven't been able to accomplish in the past that, that are now possible. 
Well, thank you. I, w I would point out that that is possible on a development environment. Perhaps we should say a progressive leading edge in development environment that's working closely with the security people. Um, there are a lot of legacy software systems for which it's very hard to find a security officer taking responsibility for those things that would um, be inviting of that kind of activity. But that's a perhaps a, a cultural um, problem uh, rather than anything else. Yeah. So like with those legacy systems, all bets are off as far as the de whole DevOps thing. Well, you know, a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? I mean, if, you, if you're bolting a new system onto an old database, if the door to the old database is open, you, you need to take responsibility for that, even if that means you have to go rattle somebody's cage and, and wake them up to certain uh, facts about, um, about the system. Mm -hmm. So uh, we only have 10 minutes left, and I'd like to reserve the last five minutes for everybody to make a closing statement, but um, I wonder if there's something that we're missing here. I mean, we've only had an hour, but I, I believe we've had some brilliant, brilliant comments, uh, but I wonder if there's something that someone is just itching to talk about and wonders why it hasn't come up yet and why we haven't had a chance to discuss that. Maybe not crickets. <laughs> oh, go, Gabriel, go. I just wanted to talk about something quick uh, that I think is really important. So at least on our teams, there's definitely a cultural clash between the people who are developing uh, because they're working in a very agile way. And then a lot of times security happens in a very uh, waterfall way. So like I, for example, would deploy maybe five times a day, but the security um, the process, like we have to fill out all this paperwork and all these forms, and it happens when we're ready to make um, a big release, not at every interval. So maybe, and, and one thing that we've done is start to invite our security people into our scrum ceremonies, and that's kind of started to bridge the gap between the way that we work and the way that uh, traditionally government has worked. And I'm sure there's a lot more that can be done in that um, to make things better. Mm -hmm. And has the, uh, has the federal government security officers been happy to attend those scrums? If, as I remember, they were a bit understaffed when I was working there. So yeah, they. I think that's. I think that's the main issue. They are very understaffed. But at the same time, imagine having to learn about five different systems on your own, or having, or at least having one where, like, we're talking about how we're developing it and having them in those conversations as well. It really gives them. It, it helps them kind of like wrap their minds around at least like one one piece of like one system and understand it in a, in a way that a person on our team would. So I think I think having them uh, attend our meetings, having them attend all these things, it like really helps, really, really kind of does help them get on the Agile path. Well, thank you. And I, I think you've expressed something that the whole panel agrees with that, that is a major effect. In the past, at least within the federal government, the mindset, if not the regulation, has been that there are these giant moments where you perform a security review and then you don't do anything else and you try not to change anything because it might introduce a security flaw until a year from now when you do it again and I think we all agree that's a terrible way to do things um, Greg and Jeff and John have talked about specific mechanisms to make it easier to do things in an agile way on a continuous basis and the, the term continuous integration and deployment is, is critically important to this discussion. I would like to point out that Noah Kunin, who works for 18F, um, has an excellent lecture at DigitalGov, um, the YouTube channel DigitalGov on YouTube, uh, about exactly this topic, although he, ha he doesn't go into uh, the automated deployment of stuff quite the way that, that Greg has mentioned it here. And I recommend everybody talk about that to understand what Gabriel is touching on. and. Agile government leadership is attempting to change the mindset of government to make it more agile, and a critical part of that is to change the way security is viewed from being a kind of one-shot process to a continuous process that's totally integrated in whatever you are doing. Um, so with that said, uh, we've only got five minutes left, so I would, would um, ask John to just start by saying whatever he thinks uh, the viewers need to know that we didn't cover in 60 seconds. Uh, I, I would just say, you know, 
implementing security these days is implementing at the speed of Twitter. So uh, it's, it's not the way that it was many years ago. So the agile methodology is very beneficial. Um, I'm more of a security professional than I am an agile professional, but I'm trying to learn to be an agile professional because the big white canvas that I'm trying to build that is a complete security program is going to come easier if I go mosaic piece by mosaic piece, to use a bad analogy. So um, I just, it, it's an open mindset. I think that's what I've heard a lot today is just about the mindset and um, you know, getting, getting security on board. But I, I think from the security professionals that I've spoken to, we're all starting to see that, that that is the, the pace in which we must secure things. So you can't set up a firewall policy of a thousand rules and wait for those a thousand rules to be in place. You kind of have to go you know, maybe in chunks of 10 at a time. And that mindset can be broken down to a lot of the things that we're doing. And we can learn from agile developers the way that they can learn from us. We just got to build those bridges. Well, that's right. And of course, at one level, if you let the hackers slow down your development effort so that the American people cannot get good software, you're letting the hackers win, right? So you, you have to develop a system which is both secure and allows the services that people need to be provided. Um, Greg, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'm going to echo what John said. I, I think so much of this is really mindset. And, and in the last 60 seconds, what I want to say is that it's really easy if you're a developer right now or you're an agile project manager to feel that cybersecurity is something for the experts that you can't contribute to. And management often inside of government makes the mistakes of deferring to the cybersecurity experts. But the goal is risk management. It's not perfect security, it's managing risk. And when it comes to managing risk, management has a lot to say about that. The stakeholders have a lot to say about it. And the developers have a lot to say about where can we prioritize our tasks? What do we want to make the story that we need to tackle first that's going to offer real value? Just like this feature offers a lot of value, which aspect of cybersecurity offers the most value to protect the most important risk. So we have to feel that we can engage in it and we have to learn and piece by piece just like we do anything else in Agile. Thank you very much, Greg. Gabriel? So I guess I'd like to just say that uh, security and compliance should be a team responsibility and that we shouldn't silo it, uh, give it to the the security people shouldn't only do security, and we should, they should, these things shouldn't be siloed. We should all be responsible for the entire system because if it fails, it's not like one person's fault. It's it's everyone's. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to plus one all of the mindset discussion that we've just had, and then put one plug in there that that uh, uh, I hope will serve as a helpful resource for the DevOps Audit Defense Toolkit. Because we're talking about mindsets and being able to, to, to build bridges to, to different skill sets and perspectives. The DevOps Audit Defense Toolkit was a, was a white paper. Um, it was a product of the collaboration of Gene Kim, me, an auditor, and an ops guy uh, that helps people understand the audit mindset in terms of business risks and control strategies and controls and bring those traditional mindsets into the DevOps world and the Agile world where you can look at your tooling and your processes in totally different ways to support compliance and get you all those outcomes that are, that are all goodness. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd really like to thank all our panelists for their time, uh, volunteering their time for this uh, to try to keep us all educated. I certainly learned a lot. I think this was a brilliant show. Uh, those of you who are viewing it on YouTube uh, afterwards, please promote the show. And um, if you have a topic or you'd like to be a guest on the show in the future, please contact us. Thank you very much. And if no one has a final comment, I'm going to go off the air. Thanks again.